Hello, everybody. Um, sorry we were a couple minutes late. Uh, thank you for joining us for what is now our fourth, uh, despite what the uh, what the title says. I, I had a typo that I noticed right when I logged on, um, and what there wasn't really time to fix it. But uh, thank you for joining us for our fourth Green Party 101. Um, these 101 series that we are doing uh, through the Green Socialist Organizing Project um, are quarterly workshops that we've been cycling all of 2022. Um, you can learn more about the 101 series at greensocialist.net slash 101s. Um, we go through, we're the Green Socialist Organizing Project, so it kind of makes sense that our, our recurring series is Green Party 101, Eco-Socialism 101, Organizing 101. Um, you know, our, our goals of, uh, of doing these workshops is to provide a, you know, a, a kind of a common foundation um, for people coming into the Green Party, for existing Greens, and to address some of the, what we think are key issues for, uh, you know, Green organizing and the Green Socialist Movement broadly. Um, so tonight, like I said, is our Green Party 101, uh, session four. Um, we change these up quite a bit as we go. You know, there's some repeat information, um, but, uh, you know, as, as we're working out how to best do these and, and things like that. So um, this is our final Green Party 101 of 2022. Um, we haven't quite decided what we're going to do in 2023, um, but I have a feeling that we'll probably mix it up a little. Um, we probably won't just do these these three things four times again. Um, I, could, I could see us doing something like, uh, you know, mixing them up doing maybe these twice right every six months and cycling something in or we may do something completely different um we'll, we'll have to figure that out um like i said if you want to learn more about the series or the green socialist organizing project you can go to greensocialist.net 101s if you want to help with these workshops um you know there's you can sign up and say you want to work with education um on uh, greensocialist.net and we'll get you into our organizing group um but uh yeah so welcome to Green Party 101, take four. Um, my name is Chris Blankenhorn. Um, I'm the Illinois Green Party Secretary, uh, former Green Party of the United States co-chair from 2016 to 2018. And I served as the Hawkins Walker 2020 social media and tech director, um, as well as most Greens wearing a lot of other hats as well. Um, with me is Garrett Wasserman. I'll let him introduce himself. Hi, everyone. I'm Garrett Wasserman, and I am a current Green Party of the United States National Student Committee co-chair, uh, as well as very active in my state Green Party of Pennsylvania. Awesome. So we will uh, roll into it. You know, I'll warn you, these can go kind of long, right? Um, so, you know, don't you, we're obviously, we, we love for people to, you know, stay with us live. Um, you can ask questions in the, in the chats. Um, you know, if you're on YouTube or Facebook, we, we see it, or I think most of the platforms, Twitter and Twitch too, um, we see your questions on the side live. Um, and from there, we can, you know, we may answer them as we go, right, as, if we see it and it fits. Um, but there's also kind of points in the workshop that are built in where we can pause and go back and, and answer some questions. So if you've got some, if you've got questions, type them into the chat on whatever platform you're watching, um, and we'll see them and we'll We'll try to address them if they're relevant. Um, try to keep it to Green Party, you know, 101 type stuff. Um, it, it's easy in uh, such a topic to go way off on tangents and and uh, then we lose track and we're here for hours. Um, but, you know, we're more than welcome to have your questions, uh, comments and that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, Green Party 101 or 12 reasons right. to join the Green Party today. You want to take it, Garrett? Yeah, sure. Let's get started. So uh, if you've seen any of our uh, previous Green Party 101s, you'll notice this one is a little bit of a different format. We're hoping that the format will be uh, a little bit more fun and shake things up um, instead of going through the way that we did things before. We're going to talk about 12 reasons to join the party, which will kind of naturally guide us into uh, cool learning cool stuff about the Green Party. Uh, so before we get started, I want to do a really quick shout out to Socialist Lorax on Twitter, who is one of our uh, Youth Caucus members in the Green Party, who put out a uh, 
a list of 10 reasons to join the Green Party that I thought was a really great list. So we tweaked it a little bit, added a couple of things, and here we are. So uh, without any further ado, let's uh, let's go ahead and get started here. Um, oh, where's the uh, forward button? Do I have that? <laughs> Good. Oh, there you go. Thank you. I can do it, though. <laughs> I've always been able to do it in the past, so whatever. <laughs> All right, so... Um, if you just kind of want the the uh, the big overview, uh, here are the twelve reasons that we're going to talk about. Uh, the Green Party is the largest explicitly eco-socialist political party in the U.S. We're the birthplace of the real Green New Deal. We grew out of grassroots movements for things like civil rights, peace, and ecology. Uh, the Green Party doesn't take corporate money, and it doesn't work with the duopoly. We're strictly independent of the duopoly. Uh, that's the Republicans and Democrats. Uh, but we do work with other parties. We're for leftist unity. We endorse other uh, independent leftists. You know, we're not trying to be uh, sectarian or campus or anything like that. We want to work together with people with our values. Um, you know, our values include things like being a uh, principled stance against war and imperialism. In fact, that's one of the four core pillars of the party uh, that sep separates us from even other, you know, progressives and people who might agree with us on certain issues, but, you know, um, Anyway, we'll get to that. <laughs> it's a it's a core part of our who we are. Um, we also acknowledge uh, the history in the U.S., which includes uh, things such as demanding reparations for the survivors of uh, you know slavery and U.S. genocide and things in in history. Um, so we have a very complete platform that covers a lot of these issues that you won't see any other party touch. Uh, we have a hundred greens in office right now, or at least a hundred, I should say. Um, and at least 1,300 have been elected uh, since the party was founded. Uh, we have a decentralized model that allows you to customize your state party to what's going on in local conditions. Um, we're democratically structured with a set of bylaws and rules and procedures and things that you can change. So if there's anything you don't like about the Green Party, we encourage you to join and change it. And lastly, um, when we speak of the Green Party, it's not just a U.S. thing. It's an international thing. There's over 100 Green Parties around the world. Uh, that we have um, communications with and ideally would grow a solidarity movement internationally with. So I think this is a really great set of reasons. And so maybe some of you are already sold. Maybe some of you are like, sign me up. I'm ready for the Green Party. And I hope so. <laughs> uh, but also uh, stick around and we'll talk a little bit more in depth about it, all of these issues so you can learn a little bit more about the history of the Green Party and the structure of the Green Party and things like that. Um, but hopefully this will kind of whet your appetite to learn more, right? So, uh, Chris, any comments or moves to the next slide? I suppose. Since no, I think I I think any comments <laughs> I make now is going to fit better in a slide. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. That we're going to get more in depth all these things. So let's just keep going. <laughs> yeah, we could spend a couple hours just without leaving this if we went point by point and talked about it. So. <laughs> all right. So the the first point is that we're the largest explicitly eco-socialist political party in the U.S. So it's actually part of our platform that we are explicitly a socialist party or anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist party. Um, so, you know, so there you go. If, if you're looking for a socialist party, the Green Party is a socialist party and it's the, it's the largest one. We're the fourth largest party in the country. Um, the Republicans and Democrats are number one and two, Libertarians are third. None of those three are socialist parties. They're all extremely capitalist, you know, right-wing parties. So. Uh, we're the we're the biggest leftist party. We're the biggest socialist party. There's a lot of cool stuff there. We're now, really when we the only left party, yeah, <laughs> we, we don't have a progressive party. We don't have a social, you know, a left of center social democratic party. Um, True. There are left of True. center social democrats and socialists within the Democratic Party, um, but the institution of the Democratic Party is not <laughs> decidedly not socialist. <laughs> um, you know, so Absolutely. as Ali said, they're lost in the sauce, you know. Um, but yeah, it, that's that's the kind of void in our pol American political culture that we're dealing with, right? Um, it, it's not that uh, we're the largest socialist party, you know, we're the only of the main of you know the four major parties that have some level of ballot access, right? Um, there are other parties, PSL, uh, Socialist Party USA. Peace and freedom, um, mm -hmm. things like that, um, but they gen they they don't have a wide you know national um, membership, and they don't have ballot access across the country. They might have it in one or two places, 
Um, they might get on a few more um, when it comes to, uh, you know, running for president and things, things like that. Um, but, you know, I, it's not only are we the largest explicitly eco-socialist party in the country, we are the only, you know, left of center uh, electoral political party um, that, that's, you know, operating nationally at this point. So um, that we're, we're yep. dealing with a made huge vacuum um, and, and, you know, the why Green Party is, you know, making the case for us. And a big question for us is how do we bring people in um, mm. as opposed to letting them get, you know, sucked into the graveyard of social movements, which is the Democratic Party. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, that's that's been going on for decades. So, yeah. Um, so I, uh, I guess I'll just mention real fast on the previous slide, we had the 10 key values. So um, when we say eco-socialism, uh, one way to, it, you know, lots of people probably argue over the definition of exactly what socialism is. And, the, you know, there's some different viewpoints on it. But our 10 key values, I think, fairly well describe what we mean, at least by eco-socialism. Um, you know, we, we see this uh, socialist view of, you know, a sustainable community-based economics that's built around, you know, democracy for workers and workplaces, as well as just broadly in communities. You know, it's a much more decentralized vision um, that allows bottom up decision making, bottom up um, democracy uh, that, you know, is integrated with, um, you know, social justice and uh, feminism and gender uh, equity uh, and just a general respect for diversity in all its forms in human cultures as well as, you know, di respecting diversity of life on the planet. So, um, you know, that's a whole complex topic that we probably shouldn't, <laughs> yeah, that would be like its own presentation. But uh, just to kind of give you a flavor of what we mean by eco-socialism, it, it's these uh, these 10 key values. Which yeah, and, on our website. You know, one, of the, one of the first education workshops or, you know, endeavors I, I got involved in the Green Party was when I was um, organizing a series of workshops for the Youth Caucus, which is the Young Eco-Socialists. Um, and this was back in 2017. Um, but we spent hours just going one <laughs> by one uh, through the 10 key values. And the, the key thing I think people need to understand when we're talking about the Green Party as an eco-socialist party is that the Green Party's always been a socialist party. Socialists were there in the very beginning of the founding. They've mm -hmm. always been a major player. Um, even if the party wasn't explicitly expressing itself as socialists in the past as it is now, you know, when you look at these 10 key values, peace, social justice, ecology, sustainable economics, democracy, decentralization, feminism and gender equality, respect for diversity, personal and global responsibility, and future focus and sustainability, capitalism can't abide by a single one of those. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. the, the demand for markets creates war, right? Uh, capitalism uses social, the differences to other, um, and so, you know, why we need social justice. It uses, it exploits people. Um, capitalism, I don't think anybody really needs a case to be made that capitalism isn't ecologically sustainable. It's literally destroying <laughs> the world, right? Um, and so when you look at these values, I'm not going to go through all 10 because we just talked about how long that could take. But when you look at these values, they're all inherently socialist, right? Um, a, a case can be made, that, an easy case can be made that capitalism is, you know, almost the antithesis to every single one of them. So mm. even though the Green Party hasn't explicitly ran out shouting it's socialist, it's always been there. It's always been, you know, a core philosophy, um, you know, the, uh, of the, that's driven the party from day one, um, not only local, you know, in the U.S., but on the global scale. Absolutely. Yep. So just to summarize all that, the Green Party is an eco-socialist, anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist political party, and an activist organization, which is something that we'll talk about on the next couple of slides, I think. Um, okay, so maybe it's point number three or something. But, <laughs> but point number two is that we're the, uh, we're the birthplace of the real Green New Deal. Uh, so the Green New Deal... Uh, Many people may have heard of it, um, especially as it gained a lot more media attention after it was adopted by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez um, and, a, you know, the small wing of progressive Democrats um, around 2018. Uh, but the Green, the Green New Deal has existed for much longer than that, and it was originally commissioned as kind of a study with, with the Global Greens, uh, dating back to, uh, I think, 2006 or seven or so is when it was originally started um, as a project. 
And the original versions of it were carried out um, as a research project by the Green Party of uh, England and Wales uh, to create the original Green New Deal. And it got a lot of attention in European elections, uh, and that brought it to the U.S., um, where it was adopted first by uh, Howie Hawkins when he ran for governor in 2010, and then by you know many Greens uh, aside from him um, across the country. Uh, it became part of the presidential uh, platform for Jill Stein in 2012 and 2016. And of course, uh, Howie Hawkins himself became the presidential nominee in 2020, uh, where it's expanded into a, uh, a really nice, very explicitly eco-socialist Green New Deal, uh, which is now officially part of the Green Party's platform. It was uh, recently voted in by the uh, Green Party's National Committee, uh, which if you're not sure what that means, we'll get to that a little bit later today, uh, around point 10 or so, I think. <laughs> but um, uh, the point is the Green New Deal started with the Green Party. It's the original Green New Deal, and it's also still the most comprehensive and best Green New Deal, uh, partly because it's eco-socialist, whereas the one uh, that was championed by some Democrats is very firmly neoliberal. It's very firmly about giving money to corporations and letting them do whatever they want, as opposed to the eco-socialist Green New Deal pushed by the Green Party, which is about enabling community control and community power over uh, you know, our energy system and our food systems and all the things that we need to change in order to deal with uh, climate change. So... Um, the Green New Deal is its own whole subject that'll take a whole <laughs> presentation. So I, I, I kind of just link here, you know, check out the website, uh, howiehawkins.us, if you want to learn more about the eco-socialist Green New Deal. Uh, but it has a lot of really great stuff in it, and it's very different in character, even if on the surface it has the same name, and on the surface it supposedly deals with climate and all. The Democrat version of it is about give money to corporations, stall the transition as much as possible so that fossil fuels can keep hanging on and doing more things and ultimately keep the capitalists in charge, which is very different from our Green New Deal, which is uh, a very urgent, rapid transition to renewable energy. And as we do so, we ensure a just transition with an economic bill of rights, and we ensure that the th new things that are built, the new renewable infrastructure, is in control of communities where it should be, uh, democratically controlled bottom-up instead of by corporations. Yeah, and you know, when Garrett mentioned that uh, it first, you know, came into policy, campaign policy in 2010 um, in the United States, um, Howie was probably the largest, you know, the biggest name um, being associated with that um, because he was running for governor of New York at the time, but over a hundred Greens around the country in 2010 ran under a unified Green New Deal platform. Mm -hmm. um, right. So we've been over a decade running on this platform, updating this platform until it's, you know, what's now the the most updated form of Howie's 2020 um, Eco-Socialist Green New Deal, which is now official uh, with the national platform. Um, you know, and Garrett also mentioned, you know, the so what most people probably think about it in terms of AOC and the progressive Democrats. Right. Um, and we actually have a direct line. Um, AOC's campaign manager when she won her house seat was an ex-Green who ran Green campaigns that ran on the Green New Deal and took it with him to the Democratic Party when they ran, right? So we, we actually have the direct lineage of the theft of that. <laughs> um, but where's the Green New Deal now, right, yeah. when you look at the Democrats? They, they abandoned it completely, right? Um, progressives have, and, and there was the, you know, there was the non-binding, you know, group that was pushing for the uh, Green New Deal, but then there was also the Demo the Progressive Democrats Thrive Agenda, um, which was actually better than their their proposed Green New Deal. But it's all gone, right? Mm. They completely abandoned it in the name of Build Back Badly, right? <laughs> and the climate sections of, of the, you know, that was passed under the, you know by the Democratic Congress recently and championed by the Biden administration, like Garrett said, you know, it's about paying corporations to be better. It's about tax breaks for, uh, or, or subsidies for electric cars that the working class can't afford even with a subsidy, right? Um, it's about opening up 600 million square miles to oil and gas. That's in the Build, the build Back Better bill. Right, that's supposedly a climate bill, but it, tucked inside of it is a massive gift, gift to the oil and gas industry, right? Um, so yeah, we've been pushing this for a long time. 
Um, and I, I, I called the Democratic Party the graveyard of social movements earlier. And the Green New Deal is a great, a great, not in a recent example of that, where they picked it up, they hijacked it, they watered it down. And then when politics came into play, the progressives put their tails between their legs, threw it in a, threw it in a closet and shut the door. Right. Mm. They, they've completely forgotten about it at this point. And we're back to the Green Party being the only advocates for a Green New Deal at all, let alone a real Green New Deal. Yep. So uh, the Green New Deal, uh, I think, is kind of our signature policy, our signature signature platform at this point. Um, and uh, but parts of our platform um, and parts of the Green New Deal. Well, wait, no. How would you put it? The, the, Green the, deal, the Green New Deal is, <laughs> New deal is not simply a, a climate <laughs> bill. Yes. Right? There you it's go. Not, That's a good way to put it. Because, because capitalism's the problem, right? Mm -hmm. the, the the core one of the core problems we have is capitalism, and capitalism is total. Capitalism, you know, invades every area of our society, every area of our culture, every area of our government, you know, or almost every. I'm sure we can find some, you know, exceptions to that rule, but they're exceptions. Um, so the the eco socialist Green New Deal as proposed by Howie, one of the big changes it made from previous ones, in addition to becoming explicitly eco-socialist, whereas Jill Stein's were more kind of liberal Keynesian uh, Green New Deals. But Howie's Green New Deal proposal that he worked on for years with an economist named John Wren um, didn't just stop at climate, right? It nestled into it, um, you know, a, a economic bill of rights that guaranteed, you know, health care through Medicare for all for a national health system, that guaranteed housing through public housing, that guaranteed a wage um, above poverty through a negative income tax, um, that gave that guaranteed a living wage um, for the, you know, for those that work for a wage, that guaranteed a sustainable retirement by doubling, uh, you know, the first step for a sustainable retirement was doubling social security payouts, right? Um, and guaranteed a lifelong educa free ed public education from pre-K all the way through higher ed. So it, it, while the Green New Deal tends to be kind of thought of and pigeonholed as a climate policy, um, it really is an overarching policy that seeks to mm. really transform the entirety of our society, the entirety of our economy, the entirety of our political system. Um, because you can't leave democracy out, right? Um, mm. One of the problems we struggle with as Greens is that we are actively repressed. Right? We are actively kept off the ballot. We are actively kicked up. You know, we just, we've seen what's happened to Matt Ho in North Carolina. Right. And so democracy is a key part of the Green New Deal because it guarantees that people can actually have a vote that matters. As opposed to right now when most most districts are gerrymandered to the point that they're not even competitive. So. It, yeah, it, it's much yeah. bigger than than that. And it's kind of started to how is version especially has kind of started to grow to the point that it's encompassing other areas of our platform that weren't necessarily mm -hmm. part of the Green New Deal. Yeah, it's it, it's integrating in with the rest of the platform, uh, which it kind of needs to because the reason we have these four pillars, social <laughs> justice, ecology, democracy, and peace, uh, is because these four issues are, are deeply intertwined with each other because of the way capitalism works. So, uh, you know, the essentially speaking there's no way to deal with one of these pillars without dealing with the rest of the pillars you've got to be able to have the very comprehensive view of these issues and a comprehensive solution and that's what our eco-socialist green new deal is growing to become there's a very comprehensive look at what society is like under capitalism and what all needs to change to create an eco-socialist society that actually deals with all of these issues underneath these four pillars so, uh, you know, you could take a moment and look through uh, some of these highlights from the Green Party's platform, um, but you could see where it's it's become very comprehensive to try to address all of these issues. Um, so the Green Party is not a one issue party, I think is maybe perhaps the way to conclude this section. <laughs> you know, they, unfortunately, people hear the word green and they think it's just the environment or the Green New Deal, just the environment. And it's not just the environment. Obviously, that is a key pillar here, ecology, uh, but there's three other pillars. Um, social justice, democracy, and peace. And all, all of them are equally important because they are also um, intersectional and intertwined with each other. All right, so uh, number three on our reasons to join the Green Party 
is that the Green Party has its roots in grassroots movements for uh, civil rights, uh, peace, and ecology. So uh, on a previous slide, we mentioned that the Green Party is not only a political party, it's also an activist organization. And this is partly why, because its roots come from these very activist uh, people's movements for all for change. That a lot of change that has come in U.S. history has come either through um, independent movements pushing for it, you know, independent political parties and candidates running and pushing for these ideas. But those those candidates and parties are on top of, um, you know, or are pushed along by uh, people's movements um, that engage in, you know, nonviolent direct action and, uh, you know, education and agitation work and, and building unions and things like this. All of these people's movements are really what drive a lot of change in the U.S. Um, and in the 1960s in particular, 1950s, 60s, 70s, in, in that time period, uh, there were a lot of changes for civil rights, uh, for, for feminism uh, and women's rights, uh, for, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing uh, gender equality rights growing. Um, environmental rights, as well as uh, the peace movement, uh, which was anti-war in general, but especially um, against nuclear weapons as, as a very existential threat to humanity, which is still something we're concerned about right now with everything going on, especially in the Ukraine right now, right? Um, but all of these movements were, um, to varying degrees, successful in the 1960s at driving change. Um, so they, as they began to drive change, the Democrats did what they usually do, which is they start to swoop in and co-opt and try to take over successful movements in order to stop leftist change, in order to maintain the system, roughly uh, speaking, as it is now, to keep uh, the capitalist and the ruling class in power. And so the Democrats, because of these movements, shifted their image to try to uh, pretend to take on this more liberal progressive persona, even though, um, you know, their actual policies uh, have not supported that for decades, right? Um, so a lot of these activists uh, from the 1960s who saw these movements uh, create change uh, and then saw it get co-opted by the Democrats said, we need our own home. We need our own place to keep up that independent struggle for change because that's where the change has always come from. Uh, that's where it came from in the past, and that's where it needs to come from in the future. We need to reorganize that independent movement after it was co-opted by the Democrats. So a lot of these original founding members from these various different groups um, got together and started talking about forming a Green Party. Um, I have a, uh, an image here uh, in the bottom right corner in C-SPAN. In 1991 is when the uh, National Green Party was kind of officially launched, and it had a uh, press conference that was covered on C-SPAN. And it's, it's still really fascinating to see that press conference today, because even though that was 30 years ago, everything they talk about is exactly uh, what we're still going through today. Um, and it shouldn't be surprising, because... Uh, we still have to build that independent movement in order to really challenge and change politics as usual, right? Um, because so many people have been, uh, or movements have been co-opted into the Democratic Party, uh, the Democratic Party has been complacent, right? They don't feel like they have to change anything because you're just going to vote for them anyway, right? <laughs> well, so we have to keep up this this independent attitude here. Um, and that's, that's our roots in the Green Party um, from all these activist movements. Um, you can even see it in, in the four pillars, right? Uh, civil rights uh, or social justice, right? Peace, ecology. Those are three of our four pillars. Mix in democracy, and then you've got our four pillars. Um, so uh, that's roughly speaking where it comes from. In the 19, early 1980s is when the Green Party was originally founded. Um, it actually started internationally first. Uh, New Zealand, I think, was actually... New Zealand and Australia were the first ones to actually run Green Candidates. Um, on a green platform, and they were so successful at uh, uh, getting elected on an environmental platform um, that other countries started trying uh, trying their own green movements. The German Green Party was the first one to be very successful and get a bunch of people elected on a green platform, and then encouraged other countries to do so as well. We saw that in the U.S., uh, where Green Party was founded uh, in uh, well eighty four. Uh, yeah, 1984 was like the first conference for it, right? Um, so and 91 it was, it, was when the Green Party became an official national yes. political party. Exactly. There you go. So it, it's a little bit of a complex thing. But mm -hmm. at that original uh, 1984 meeting, um, 
Howie Hawkins was there, but he was there to represent the Clamshell Alliance, uh, which was one of the the one of these uh, grassroots movements, right? Um, uh, numerous uh, movements were there, sent representatives there to discuss the possibility of forming a Green Party, and then of course it ended up happening. Yeah, uh, I, hey, Chris. I think that's a really interesting, you know, point about our formation, right? As a party, as an and as an organization, is that from the very start. It wasn't that the Ill, you know Greens from Illinois sent people to the to Minnesota to go to the first uh, the first Green gathering, the first convention. Um, it was that social movements sent representatives, mm -hmm. uh, right? So you know Howie was there as a representative of the Clamshell Alliance, which was an anti nuclear organization in the Northeast that actually stopped um, you know nuclear plants from being built and, and really played a major role in the pause, um, you know, that, that we kind of saw in the, uh, the construction of nuclear, po you know, power plants in the United States in the latter half of the 20th century. Um, so it wasn't just kind of inside baseball, right? It wasn't just people who'd been, you know, considered themselves greens and were inspired by, you know, the German, the German and Australian and New Zealand successes, right? Mm -hmm. It was movements that wanted something more and wanted to come together, right? And and there's been, this has happened a few times with things like the Labor Party, but all of those other organizations and entities have eventually been absorbed into the Democratic Party, and you now see nothing of them anymore, right? The Labor Party is dead; it's gone. Um, there's still one in South Carolina. Um, they, <laughs> then they deal with ballot access issues too, right? Um, so the, there's it, we have a very interesting formation, um, you know, a very interesting history. Yep. And so to kind of reemphasize that slide from earlier, uh, we're a political party and an activist organization, and our history shows that because it was a uh, representatives of various social movements that got together that decided to form a Green Party in the first place. And that initial Green Party structure was very focused on activism and education and organizing. Um, and then as it became the party as we know it today in 2000, when it was officially formed as the Green Party in the United States, it did adopt more of an electoral stance, but we still have an activist uh, kind of core in a lot of our uh, platform and messaging and all uh, that we, we admittingly do have to rebuild, um, but um, you know, we are rebuilding it and we're working on it. That's part of what the Green Socialist Organizing Project is all about. So. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I guess this is the appropriate place to talk about it, but, you know, to, to kind of mix electoralism with activism, uh, just some ideas uh, about, uh, or not ideas, but examples of what uh, Greens have done either through their activism or uh, by getting in office. Well, I guess maybe even both, right? <laughs> Being activists in office. Um, we had uh, Jason West, who's a former green mayor of New Plots, New York, who was actually the first to officiate same-sex marriages uh, before it was considered legal. Um, so, you know, this is a really powerful way that Greens can get in office and uh, push for social change and push for, uh, yeah, push for social change before the Democrats and Republicans accepted it, you know. I, and be on the leading edge of issues. Yeah, exactly. I mean, because, I... Because he was mayor, he was a justice of the peace and therefore allowed mm -hmm. to marry people, right? And so he was in a position as a Green where he had the authority to marry someone and it would be legal. Um, mm -hmm. and was able to then leverage that to push the issue to the forefront and start ma marrying, you know, doing gay, they're doing same sex marriages. And, you know, it, it was a kind of early volley, you know, in that, and <laughs> what it, you know, and, and when we look at how we, how do we get same sex marriage federally? It wasn't because the Democrats acted. Mm -mm. Right, it was because of the Supreme Court, um, yeah. and it's never been federally protected by the Democrats, yeah. even when they had the power. Right? Yeah, no, and it, and actually, I I like to it, for uh, for perhaps uh, the youth in the audience, um, I, <laughs> I'm starting to get old enough that now I remember all this stuff. But like, <laughs> I just in case the youth in the audience who who didn't know about uh, past presidents and all, uh, Barack Obama, the the previous Democratic president before Joe Biden. Uh, 
he and Hillary Clinton, who were the two major nominees for the Democratic Party in 2008, 2012, they were against same-sex marriage until, I think, 2013. Like, the, it was really not that long ago that Democrats were against this stuff. It was Greens that were leading the fight. It was people taking it to the Supreme Court that were leading the fight. It was not the Democratic Party. And, I mean, the thing that in 2008 that baffled me, I remember that election and fighting with, friend, you know, liberal friends of mine. Barack Obama was a black man calling for separate <laughs> but equal. That's what he advocated for, right? And and he didn't have a he didn't change his mind until the the, polit the politics were so overwhelmingly flipped that he didn't have a choice, right? The mm -hmm. and this is something you'll see with a lot of things, right? Ninety four percent of Democrats support Medicare for all, but the leadership doesn't. Joe Biden said he would he would veto it, mm -hmm. right? And and I know when I. Post the Supreme Court decision on gay marriage, somehow Joe Biden was rehabilitated, was rehabilitated into this like champion for gay marriage. When in fact he supported "Don't Ask, Don't Tell," he supported mm -hmm. the Defense of Marriage Act. He was actively, as a you know, a member of Congress, as a member of the Senate, opposed to it and and you know oppressing the LGBT, LGBTQI plus community, right? So the. We, this is one of the many issues that, despite how the Democrats posture today, the reality of their very recent history is far different. Um, and it was actually, you <laughs> know, is, it was Greens and activists yeah. and movements mm -hmm. that got this stuff done. Yeah, this is what I meant on the previous slide about how uh, Democrats will resist things until there's a social movement that pushes it, and then they swoop in and co-opt it and they act like they were always on their side. And that is not true. We have to always hold their feet to the fire. We always have to all... Uh, keep the pressure up on them. And one way to do that is by being an independent Green Party member, right? So uh, continuing with our list here, uh, Gail McLaughlin, who was a former Green Mayor of Richmond, California, uh, made important policing reforms. Um, and especially the thing I think is very interesting is use uh, the power of eminent domain, which is very often used, unfortunately, uh, to, to take property and give it to, you know, fossil fuel companies or something like that uh, for private profit. Gail McLaughlin flipped that around and used eminent domain to seize housing and make sure that uh, there was there was public housing for people to live in during the 2008 housing crisis uh, to make sure that people weren't evicted from their homes, that they still had places to live. And I think, again, that's another really great uh, example of ways that we can uh, use our power in even local offices that Greens, you know, can make a huge difference. And you're not going to hear about, you know, uh, in national media, the green running for, you know, a local mayor, for example, uh, as opposed to Congress, right? Media focuses on things like Congress, but it was really important that we had a green mayor, um, in a city like that to do something like this. You know, it, it changed the lives for a lot of people. So there's a lot of power at these local offices where the greens very often do win. Um, so we have to keep that in mind that, you know, um, we can win in, in, uh, change policy a lot to help people and grow the movement from those changes. Yeah. That, I want people to pause and hear that again. They seized housing that was going to be foreclosed on from banks, mm -hmm. right? That is a radical revolutionary thing. And it kept people in their homes, yep. right? And all it took was having a green mayor and a supportive city council, right? And so, we can make huge, huge impacts on people's everyday lives, you know, without ha without getting control of Congress or the presidency, which is not a, you know, which is a long term goal, right? Mm -hmm. not, but in the short term, we can have huge impacts, right? And in local races, the number of votes you need, you know, the number of, um, you know, the, the the metrics of everything are much more much smaller and much more attainable. But I mean, the power of that, right? Like people mm -hmm. really need to think about like what a move that was, right? To say, to take the property from the banks to keep people in their homes. And I've seen social movements like an organization called Action Now out of Chicago that actually goes to the banks and says, you know, give us your abandoned properties because you don't actually want to maintain them. You're, you're stuck with them because you foreclosed, right? But that's not, that's like, a few steps below what Gail McLaughlin did, um, you know, in, in, in Richmond. And it's just, it was such a powerful move at such an important time. 
um, you know, that should have been, you know, a rallying call. Mm -hmm. But politicians of both parties are beholden to these banks that are foreclosing on people. So, you know, that it's it kind of became a one off. But as Greens, we should always keep it in the back of our mind. That's the kind of stuff we can do if we're local, if we're elected to local office. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I don't want to get held up on this slide too much. So I, yeah. I just kind of want to mention the last few bullet points here that, you know, we, we've had Greens like the Reverend Edward Pinky who's fought against, uh, you know, local uh, capture of local government by corporations, you know, so, uh, uh, you know, politicians putting the corporation ahead of the needs of the people. Uh, Sherry Honkala was uh, Jill Stein's running mate in 2012 uh, as the Green Party's uh, vice presidential nominee. Um, and Sherry's still uh, very active in Philadelphia advocating uh, for the homeless population or houseless population and founded the Poor People's Human Economic Rights Campaign that still does a lot of uh, activism in and organizing around that. Um, and it's, it's a really great organization if you want to look into it. And when Sherry uh, was running yeah. for State House a few years ago, um, yes, she was, you know, part of her campaign was that if she was elected, her offices, including her office in the Capitol, mm -hmm. were going to become homeless shelters, right? She was going to That's house right. people. <laughs> Until the state office. dealt with it, she was going to house people, right? Yeah, it was, and it was a really great uh, slogan. And uh, again, I, it would and be when like- when we say people, you know, that we're repressed, it's yeah. not just us playing the victim. Multiple people went to jail for the, for the shenanigans yeah. that were, you know, happened when Sherry lost that race. like. It was a write-in campaign because yes. the state lied. Yeah. They told the they told Sherry's campaign they had everything she needed to be on the ballot, and then waited till the day after to say, "Oh, you didn't have this, right?" Um, so she wasn't on the ballot. So it was a write-in campaign. People were removed in in that election. You couldn't write your own candidate in. You told the poll worker, and they put a sticker with the name, and then people were caught removing stickers and putting the Democrat on. Right. And so like when, when we say we're repressed, I mean, we mean illegal stuff is done to make sure that mm -hmm. greens are kept off the ballot. Right. Sherry was such a threat to bring, you know, poverty and homelessness to the, you know, to the forefront that they went to the literally people went to prison. Yeah. Um, to, to stop. Yeah, there was. Yeah, there there uh there were Democrats who were standing out front of poll places telling people that, oh, you can't write in Sherry. You're not allowed to do that. And and all kinds of really misinformation. So and, and yes, people did literally go to jail. <laughs> so um, but anyway, that's that's a whole other discussion. It does lead into the last point though that Jill Stein after her 2016 campaign uh launched a few lawsuits in a few states, including Pennsylvania, uh, because of problems around voting. Um in Pennsylvania we used all electronic voting machines. Uh, that uh, you couldn't audit. Um, and so uh, Jill Stein's lawsuit eventually ended in a settlement, at least in Pennsylvania, where we now have paper ballots. And thanks to COVID, we now have paper ballots that we can mail in. That was a thing you could never do before. It's it's really amazing to vote here in Pennsylvania now. But that was not true before. And that was not true until the Green Party, until Jill Stein and Greens in Pennsylvania sued to make that happen. It wasn't the Democrat governor that made it happen. <laughs> it was us. In fact, he fought the lawsuit for years before finally settling and changing it. So, um, you know, these, these are ways that Greens can make a difference. Um, and so, you know, keep these examples in mind there, you know, some examples, but there's plenty more. Um, all right. So number four is an easy one. The green party does not take any corporate money. Uh, we are completely free of corporate money. Uh, we don't accept it at all. Uh, we don't support any of the, the dark money, super PACs, like none of that. No, nope, no. Nope. We run on grassroots donations. Um, our members and our supporters donating directly to the party, uh, you know, five, ten dollars at a time. Uh, that's how we're funded. Um, and you could look up all of our records and, you know, the IRS and stuff and confirm that. Um, so not only do we not take the corporate money ourselves, but we, of course, also support uh, various reforms uh, to get corporate money out of the entire election system, not just, um, you know, not just our party, right? Like making sure that, uh, no parties are doing this. <laughs> um, so that includes like publicly funded elections and a bunch of other stuff that we'll talk about. Um, but you go ahead, Chris. I saw you about to talk. <laughs> oh, I, I don't even remember what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, oh, look at the FEC, not the IRS. 
Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, FEC, yeah. As a political party, we answer to the Federal Election Commission. Um, as a, a yes, correct, correct. Sorry about that. <laughs> We're technically a not-for-profit. <laughs> yep. So um, number five, um, if, if point number four was independent from capital, right, independent from big money, the number five is also independent from um, the duopoly, from the two-party system, the Democrats and Republicans. Um, and what's important, I think, to note here is that we engage in independent politics as a strategic principle in our in our fight for the working class, for creating eco-socialism. This isn't just a tactic that we adopt, like, no, maybe if we think it's okay in this election, or, oh, no, maybe not in this one, we'll, we'll support a Democrat, which is what you see from a lot of organizations. That's what they do. They kind of play around with the idea of being independent, but then mostly end up supporting Democrats anyway, and, and they get absorbed by the Democratic Party. That's not true for us. It's, as a first strategic principle, we have to maintain our independence, our own ballot line, our own candidates. We don't support the Democrats. We don't support the Republicans. Oh, and just the, mm -hmm. that, the case for the independent left party. Um, mm -hmm was a uh, an ebook that we put out during the 2020 presidential campaign mm -hmm. uh, it is super short right like 30 pages um no section is longer than maybe a couple pages right so even it's short it's digestible it goes through the history of you know bottom up independent parties it talks about you know the memberless parties, the memberless parties that we have in the United States, yeah, and, and that are very different from a lot of other countries, right? But what does it mean to be a member of the Democratic Party? It basically means vote blue no matter who, right? Um, you don't. There's no power. There's no bottom up control. Mm -hmm. but, like I said before, you know, 94 percent of them, of Democrat support uh, Medicare for all. Over 60 percent support a Green New Deal, right? But that's not being played out in the leadership and the, the you know yeah yeah in, in the way that the party rules when they're in power yeah so. actually to to build on that quick it's uh the case for an independent left party is a really great ebook you should definitely get that from the howie hawkins.us website um and uh it's very short but it has a a really great summary of the history of socialist politics in the u.s and in particular the socialist party um and that history is one reason why we have uh, independent politics, our own independent party with our own independent ballot line as a strategic principle and not just a, um, a tactic that can be, you know, turned on and off whenever we want. It's because we've learned from history that that is what's necessary to, to create a movement for eco-socialism. Um, the Socialist Party was independent and it funded itself not through the donations from the wealthy, but through membership dues. And that allowed it to maintain its independence um, to keep up the struggle against the, uh, you know, the capitalist parties. And um, at its height, you know, it had hundreds of, of Socialist Party members in state legislatures across the country and was even had a few members in Congress. Um, and, you know, I, uh, well, I don't want to get too much into the history of that, but like that, you know, they, they were very influential, right? So we should learn from that history about what it takes to uh, to build an independent movement against capitalism. And I, one of those lessons is to maintain our independence. Yeah. And we're working on a, we're working on something where we'll go more in depth and into that actual piece of the case for an independent left party. And while we don't work with the duopoly, right. We do work with other left parties. Um, yeah. I think that's the next point. <laughs> that's the next slide. Cool. I'll, I will pause on that then. <laughs> okay. The next one after the quote. <laughs> but um, it, there was a cool Karl Marx quote if you want to go back to it. But yeah. um, um, just to kind of highlight the point of independence, you know, if if you want to claim to be a socialist party and all, right? Like, you know, um, Karl Marx is is one of the the big figures in socialist thought. Um, and a quote, I'm actually not sure what letter or book this comes from. We should double check that. Um, I mean, I have it written down. I just didn't put it on the slide. But anyway, it says, um, you know, workers must put up their own candidates in order to preserve their independence, to count their forces, and to bring before the public their revolutionary attitude and party standpoint. 
In this connection, they must not allow themselves to be seduced by such arguments of the Democrats as, for example, that by doing so, they are splitting the, the part, Democratic Party and making it possible for reactionaries to win. The ultimate intention of such phrases is to dupe the proletariat. So to, to kind of translate that, don't believe in the spoiler stuff, right? Like, it's um, it's all about building an independent movement. They're, they're capitalists that are going to complain no matter what we do. We just <laughs> we have to do our socialist organizing and organize to win. And, um, you know, that recognizes the challenge and that this is a long-term struggle, not just any one particular election. Yeah, and I think it's also important, you know, the, the Green Party is historical debate, right? Activism and, or you know, activism versus electoralism and it's got to be both mm -hmm. it has to be has to has to has to be both right especially in our modern political you know political culture a huge amount of power is sequestered within electoralism mm -hmm. right like it or not right there's a lot of power there and chain you know it's short of a you know massive revolution um which i don't think is in you know i, I don't think a successful socialist revolution is in the short term you know, realm of possibility really for within the United States. Um, you know, so taking that into mind, you know, we've got to be active in our communities and mutual aid and all that kind of stuff, right? We've got to be active on issues. We've got to be trying to pressure people, but we've also got to be putting people up uh, for mm -hmm. election to, to, to try to create more Gail McLaughlin's, right? Yeah, more, people, exactly. <laughs> more, more Jason West's who can take these actions that will inspire more people and can start to cause a bot, not a top down shift, right? The progressive mm -hmm. Democrats seem to think that, it, that they're going to change things top down, right? By electing people to con better people to Congress without yeah. acknowledging that Congress and, you know, the wash in Washington and U.S. political culture is rotten mm -hmm. and corrupting, right? And we're seeing that corruption when we look at you know, the actual votes and actions versus the words of progressives in Congress, right? So by running candidates for local office, we're trying to actually institute change bottom up, right? Insp inspire it rather than, than you know, dictating it. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. And so, you know, that's, that's a huge thing that we have to, you know, kind of grapple with as socialists. And, and I will say, too, one thing that's always bothered me about kind of anti the anti-electoralism left is basically where it leaves the working class. You're not going to get socialism until we have a revolution that overthrows capitalism, or you're not going to get you're not going to get healthcare until we have a revolution that overthrows capitalism. That's not a socialist perspective, in my opinion, right? Because it tells the it tells the working class you just got to die without healthcare until we're until we can successfully overthrow the government, right? Whereas we, you know. I think we need to try every avenue to get people health care because tens of millions of people don't have it. Tens of millions more people have to, you know, are underinsured and people are literally dying. Right. So to write it off and say not until the revolution is condemning those people to death and, and almost rubber stamping that those deaths. So, you know, it, it's got to be a both, not an either or. Um, and, and this understanding really goes back to the origins of socialism with Marx. Definitely. All right. So here's number six. Uh, if you want to go for it, Chris, I know that you yeah, some. we are we are for leftist unity, and we do endorse independent leftists. Um, you know, a couple examples in the graphics. You know, we invite activists and candidates that share our values to join the green movement, but we don't require it, and we're happy to work in coalitions. Um, we're not non-sectarian. We're not campus non-campus. I would actually say that the green, in addition to you know all the other things we've said about the Green Party. The Green Party is probably the largest um, non-sectarian organization in the United States. Um, yeah, I, I guess maybe the largest left, you know, but, you know, a lot of other parties, um, you know, like PSL have a very narrow, um, you know, they're, they're, ML, they're Marxist Leninists, right? Um, for the most part, um, social, socialist alternative are mostly Trotskyites. Um, whereas in my time with the Green Party, you know, I work, obviously I work closely with Garrett, who comes very much from a Bookchin communalist background. Um, I come from a more bottom left anarcho-communist, but very based in Marxism background. And, you know, one of my main mentors and best friends of the party is a, light, you know, a lifelong Marxist-Leninist. And we all work together and we all, you know, it, 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 it doesn't exist in a lot of places, and I've been involved 
in a lot of left organizations from the local to the national level. Um, and the Green Party is one of the few non-sectarian organizing spaces that I've, I've found to survive. Um, so during the presidential campaign in 2020, we were endorsed by the Socialist Party, which Howie had been a member of since the 60s, um, since before the splits and everything that has happened <laughs> to the defense. Um, you know, we were endorsed by Legal Marijuana Now. We were endorsed by student debt organizations. Um, we were endorsed by, um, oh, what's the name of the workers group? The, the Independent Socialist Group, um, out of which is based out of Massachusetts. We were endorsed by DSA locals who got a lot of heat um, for, mm -hmm. for bucking the DSA party line, which was silent support for Biden. Um, that was de facto their position, um, but some there were a number of locals that bucked that, and they endorsed Howie in the so the only you know it was the only socialist campaign on the ballot. Um, so we you know we've had that we we engaged in that in 2020. In 2022, the Green Party of California collaborated with the Peace and Freedom Party to put up a, a unity slate, um, where different members of different parties filled different positions on the slate. Um, and part of that is dealing with um, California's top two uh, electoral system, where the top it's an open primary and the top two people advance. So in that system, it doesn't it makes even less sense than a non top two for Greens and Peace and Freedom to run against each other, right? Because they're literally only one of them, only two people can advance. Um, so they they collaborated and came up with a joint slate. Um, and we're seeing this grow, right? Where I, I know in on my local level, I've always worked with other left, leftist organizations. I know in Allegheny County where Garrett's at, you know, green candidates get sunrise and DSA endorsements, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So. Yeah, one of our state representative candidates actually just got a sunrise endorsement. Um, yeah. So. And so those kind of collab, I, I will say uh, just real quick, because I saw it. You know, Brewer's Pilot said, very interesting that some DSA members mm -hmm. endorsed Howie Hawkins just recently as a, D a DSA organizer was telling me how he was happy the Democrat Party prevents gr the Green Party from ballots. So first off, Brewers, you should make sure that person knows they are actively anti-democratic. They don't believe in democracy, right? And that, that's the position of the Democratic Party. But and, and it's happening. That person made that statement at a time that the Democrats are trying to champion themselves as Mm -hmm. You know, the, the pe only people fighting for democracy, when in reality, they're one of democracy's biggest enemies, right? I live in Illinois, where we've been democratic controlled for a long time. Who wrote the laws that say I have to collect 22 times as many signatures to run for Congress as a Democrat or a Republican? The Democrats wrote those laws, and the Republicans co-signed them, right? But despite these problems on the, you know, the, the kind of macro level, the big picture national level, where... You know, I don't think we're going to see DSA buck from the Democratic Party for a while. Um, New York DSA just rejected it. Uh, the young, the youth caucus of the DSA just endorsed it. They endorsed a dirty break. Um, but on the national level, it's much harder to get movement, right? A whole lot harder to get movement. But on the local level, that's where we see these kind of endorsements happen, right? I know North Carolina also has a number of DSA endorsements for people like Matthew Ho. Um, and Joshua Bradley is running for Raleigh City Council, right? So these endorsements are, they happen best at this moment in the political climate at the local level where we're working together on issues, where we're working each other with each other in the movements, right? And when you're working with each other in the movement and then someone from another coalition member runs for state house or runs for city council, it only makes sense because you work with each other, you have the relationship, right? And those local organizations of DSA, of Sunrise, are not as, you know, clamped down and controlled uh, by mainstream democratic activists like their national organizations are. And so, you know, in terms of building left unity with that, you know, those kind of groups, which are, you know, traditionally democratic front groups, we've got to start at the bottom, start building those relationships. And as they're endorsing us and we're winning and we're endorsing them and we're, win you know, they're winning, although that doesn't usually happen with DSA because they almost always run as Democrats, right? And we don't endorse Democrats. But as those relationships build, it becomes a lot harder for the, the you know, national level to keep their grip and to, you know, to, to keep pushing back against independent uh, politics. So 
I, you know, I think the hope for left unity has to start bottom up, just like the hope most of the things we're talking about. The hope starts bottom up. Um, otherwise, we're just trading one master for another. Yeah, agreed. So uh, Greens very regularly seek out you know, coalitions and endorsements from all these groups, like we were mentioning. A lot of Green candidates end up endorsed by uh, you know the local DSA chapter or the local uh, socialist alternative or PSL or something like Sierra that. Sierra Club. Sierra Clubs. I, yeah, it, it, it really varies a lot because as Chris was saying, um, a lot of the groups uh, are nationally kind of aligned with and co-opted by the Democratic Party, but the local groups um, will oftentimes kind of buck right they they kind of they'll have enough autonomy to kind of be like no no we're gonna we're gonna work with an independent candidate we're gonna work with a green candidate um so it it does happen but it depends a lot on what city or state you're talking about of course as to which chapter <laughs> you know is more open we, to or not. we dive really deep into this when we get into our organizing workshops right yeah um, but another i think really one of the key things isn't so much their autonomy but the relationship right true when, sure. you know uh, to when, when a green that's been involved in coalitions, that's been involved in movements with these organizations runs, they know them. They say, Garrett's legit, right? I, I, I know Garrett's politics. It's not, you know, I, I trust Garrett when he says things. Yeah. And they'll back him. Whereas, opposed, you know, when we're talking the national level, they don't know you. You're just another politician spouting words. And in politics, in life in general, but in politics especially, words ain't shit, right? Platforms don't mean anything. Um, yeah. And without that trust and that, you know, that relationship, um, it's hard to build that kind of left unity. And it's hard to convince them to buck those that have a lot of power, like the Democrats. Yeah, but on the local level, that, that trust is kind of your, uh, your, I don't know, your skeleton key that opens the door, right? Um, that, that lets you get through to that. So, um, yeah, to, to give an example of that, um, the state representative candidate I mentioned earlier in Pennsylvania, who was recently endorsed by Sunrise, part of the reason she was endorsed is because, um, you know, she's a working class nurse, has been very active in Medicare for All and Green New Deal organizing. So they know her and they trust her. So it was, it was, a, uh, um, it wasn't hard at all for them to say we endorse her. <laughs> So, and the reality is, they probably don't know and don't trust the Democrat running for the same position. No, right? like, well, <laughs> I know when I see, you know, whenever my state house or state rep or whatever is around, it's all about politicking and glad handing, right? It's not an honest relationship. It's not an honest engagement. It's it's all superficial and it's all about electoralism. Um, so when it comes down to it, you know they. They know it's someone they know versus know and trust versus someone they don't know and don't trust. Yep. So I guess kind of feeding into the activism, number seven here is that uh, the Green Party is an anti-war, anti-imperialist party. Um, and that's uh, one of our four pillars that we were talking about earlier. Um, and, you know, that comes from the fact that the party comes from grassroots movements that were for these things. Um, and our commitment to it, aside from it being a pillar, you know, we have things like a national, uh, peace action committee that, uh, you know, reviews, uh, issues and, and makes some recommendations. Um, and I think the main thing that I want to point out here is that, um, I've heard this, this sort of, um, uh, commentary from a number of people when I, when I speak to activists about the, the Green Party, that this peace pillar, this this uh, nonviolence pillar, uh, is oftentimes kind of the deciding factor for a lot of people on why they join the Green Party as opposed to other organizations. Because, and again, it's a little bit superficial because when you consider things like the Green New Deal, our Green New Deal is very different from the one that you often hear about in the media that's the watered-down Democrat version of it. Um, but at least superficially, you know, when people first hear about the Green Party and they first hear about you know, let's say Bernie Sanders type Democrats, right? They'll kind of superficially say, well, it sounds like you support some of the same domestic policy. So I'm not sure what the difference is here. What really, what really wins people over is this peace stance because Bernie Sanders, AOC, every single one of them has been voting for um, the 700 plus billion dollar war budget. 
they've been voting to give money to a hundred thousand more police officers, you know, like, you know, this, this agenda of, uh, you know, war and police state is still, even among the progressive Democrats is they a wholeheartedly hundred percent support that. So this pillar very clearly sets the green party separate from the Democrats. Um, even though I think on economic policy and all, we're also very clearly separate because we're eco-socialists. Uh, again, this, this peace pillar, I think is just very obvious once you put that, put them side by side. Right. So I like to when, emphasize that. You know, when you think about a green new deal, right. It, it's a climate policy. Mm -hmm. I don't know how a serious green new deal proposal doesn't address the, the single largest polluting entity in the world, which is the U S military. Right. There are there are other sectors that might contribute more. But when it comes to one single entity, right, no one pollutes more than the U.S. military. So if we really want to be serious about climate, we really have to be serious about demilitarization. Um, and if we're not putting that in, um, it creates problems for are we really t you know, trying to address the climate? And also, how are we going to fund things? Um, because we're <laughs> putting a huge num amount of our discretionary budget um, to you know, war and debt. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, number eight is that the Green Party is uh, uh, perhaps the only party. I'm not sure. But uh, it's, in our, it's in our platform that we support reparations. So there's actually a quote from a platform there that we commit to full and complete reparations to the African-American community of this nation for the past 400 plus years of genocide, slavery, land loss, destruction of identity, and stark disparities, um, you know, including education and jobs and um, uh, higher levels of mortality, and uh, especially what's going on today, mass incarceration. So... Uh, you know, part of our social justice platform and all is is recognizing this racial disparity here and this this legacy of, uh, you know, racism and white supremacy and all that has gone through American history. Um, you know, the Green Party has it in a platform and, and, you know, we're not afraid to admit that and to say that we have to work toward that um, with a community led effort for reparations. Right. Um, and that's not something that you'll see in any other party. In fact, I think I feel like someone had tried to push to put this in the Democratic Party platform in 2020 and it failed. You know, like the, the Democratic Party elites, of course, were not going to touch this. <laughs> well, and historically, there was HB 40. I may be wrong on that number. Um, but historically, there was a, a bill that was, um, you know, for decades introduced into Congress with the goal of, you know, starting the process of studying reparations, which is kind of mm -hmm. is the first step you have to take, right? Figuring out mm -hmm. what exactly are we talking about? And it was one of those bills that was always put up when the Republicans had control. And then when the Democrats came into power, all of a sudden it was miraculously missing. Uh, <laughs> right. It was never raised and, <laughs> and, you know, pushed when they had the actual power to, to pass it. And we, it's not just, you know, limited to reparations for, you know, the African-American community, we have a whole section on indigenous rights, right? Yes. And, and, and platform sections on it. Yeah, I saw a post recently on one of the Green Party pages about reparations. And someone said, well, what about indigenous reparations? And why isn't it in this section? Of, oh, it's because we just updated our set, our platform on uh, regarding reparations for, you know, African-Americans. And the response was, oh, it's, it's a different, it's a whole other platform section. Like, you know, indigenous rights has their own area. Mm -hmm. um, deal with this and it, indigenous rights are a whole other type of reparations, right? Because we're talking about, you know, independent nations here. Um, and, and so one thing that, you know, the reparations issue, open borders, support for boy, BDS, boycott, divestment and sanctions, um, the Green Party is a liberatory party, mm -hmm. right? Um, we're not looking at, um, we're not talking about, you know, diversity quotas <laughs> and things like that that you'll get out of, you know, liberal politicians. Um, you know, we're not talking about, you know, LGBTQ or women CEOs of Raytheon and Shell, right? Um, we're talking about liberatory. We're, we take a liberatory stance on a lot of these policies, um, you know, with things like reparations, with things like open borders, 
Um, you know, so I, I think it's a huge, another huge area where there's a vast difference. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, oh, yeah. just with open borders, I mean, the, the most deporting president in history was Barack Obama. And I haven't looked at the numbers in probably about a year, but early on in Joe Biden's presidency, he was on pace to out deport Obama. Um, and he has kept many of Trump's awful immigration policies in place, right? Mm -hmm. um, despite the fact that the Republicans are yelling at that and, and trying to make a campaign point, I get things all the time in of my political junk mail that says that the Democrats are pushing for open borders and it's just not true. <laughs> they are, you know, actually in many, in most cases, worse than the, than the Republicans in their actual enforcement. Um, mm -hmm. So... Yeah. Uh, I do want to go back to the peace one real quick because Brewers Pilot said, how did we settle on 75% mm. military budget cut? Why not a higher percent? Um, as someone who is heavily involved in Howie's campaign during the the kind of creation of our proposal that was 75%, um, there's a few reasons. One, 75% is a start, right? It, it's it, Decommissioning the military is going to, it's going to take decades. Um, I didn't realize this till I started, you know, working on this policy proposal with, as part of the campaign. We have three times as many nuclear reactors on Navy ships than we do in commercial operation in the United States, right? And aircraft carriers have multiple nuclear reactors. Um, it's going to take decades to decommission those, right? Um, it's going to take decades to deal with the depleted uranium that we put in things and you know, we're talking about really awful toxic stuff. Um, so 75% was a start. It was phase one. Um, the other, you know, I, I was on a panel with someone during the campaign and they postured as I, I would cut it 100%. And I responded and I said, well, then who's going to defend your socialist revolution? <laughs> we need a military if we're going to make these changes because capitalist countries will try to respond. Right, there will be a back capitalist backlash. There will be, you know, right wing militias rising up in this in this country to try to push back the gains of any socialist movement. Um, so there is a need for a level of self defense, right? A level of national defense um, that we that we at least in the short term will have to maintain. Um, but the real the big thing for the seventy five percent is it's the start, right? We start doing it and we see where things are going to go. Um, but the other half of it is any rebel, any socialist, you know, movement, every socialist transformation is going to face a major back put, you know, backlash from the right, uh, both domestically and internationally. And we'll, we will need a way to, uh, try to defend ourselves. And, um, also we're, when we're talking about the military, um, just like other workers, they, we need to make sure they have a just transition. Right, one of the one of the best, probably one of the quickest ways to end your socialist revolution is to unilaterally fire the entire military immediately. Um, you have well trained, well armed people who will just—it's coup time, right? And we we actually kind of saw this with what we did in Iraq when we unilaterally just you know disbanded the their entire military and then spent twenty years dealing with the fallout um, because there was no professional military to deal with the you know, the destabilization that we caused and occupiers will never, you know, solve that destabilization as we learned. But I wanted to jump back because that was always a, an interesting kind of nuanced topic of why that 75% and, and yeah. Great. Let's see. So uh, point number nine of 12 is that uh, there's over 100 greens, at least in office right now. And at least 1,300 have been elected since the uh, party was first founded. Uh, well, actually, I'm not sure what year that is, because as we talked about, there's kind of a few different founding years. <laughs> but I, um, you know, it, it, let's say in the past, like, 30 years, right? Something like that. Um, so uh, there's a nice little graphic there that kind of uh, explains it, that uh, we've had over 1,300 uh folks elected to office. Now, most of these have been uh, local office, but as we mentioned with um, uh, Gail McLaughlin and um, um, who was the guy? I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> but uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, there were Greens that, um, you know, from local offices were really able to, to create change. 
So I kind of want to emphasize that again, that it's not just about winning Congress. It's not even about winning state legislatures. Uh, that sometimes being on city council or school board can make a huge difference for your community. Um, and Greens, uh, you know, over 1,300 of them have won these types of offices and have, have changed their communities, have had an impact on their community. Um, so, you know, that's a starting point. And obviously we would like to run way more candidates than this. And we need to run way more candidates than this to create an eco-socialist movement. Um, there's literally tens of thousands of local offices around the country. So like, you know, we really have to expand the movement, but of course you, ha you also have to start somewhere. So, there's you know- Approximately um, 500,000 elected offices in the United States. Yeah, <laughs> right. So it needs to be a lot more than, than just this. Um, but that means that, you know, we need more folks joining their local parties, uh, recruiting candidates for office, um, potentially running for office themselves. Uh, you know, green candidates uh, don't fall out of trees or out of the sky or anything like that. They're everyday people like you or, you know, me or Chris or someone deciding that they want to run for school board um, or uh, their local city council or their local water conservation district board. Or, you know, there's lots of different uh, offices that vary depending on the state. Um, so it's, it's up to you and, and, you know, everybody to decide whether or not it's appropriate for you or to support some other candidate. But, um, in any case, uh, greens often do win at local levels when we run, that's, that's the key point that I want to make here that, uh, when green candidates run, there's a very high success rate. And, uh, the issue is, is not that greens can't win. The issue is more that we need to recruit a lot more people. <laughs> and that happens as we get more people involved in the party, as you join, as you pay dues and, and contribute funds, as you help recruit candidates, you help with a campaign, um, all of these aspects. Um, yeah, it, mm -hmm. you know, I, there's a couple questions that I'll get to in a minute that are applicable to this, but, uh, well, one thing I want to raise is you know the idea of registrations um mm -hmm. and the you know i think there's only about 30 states that even allow registration right so the united states has set up a, a, a you know political system actually 50 plus mm -hmm. small political system right not one unified so what it means to be a green can be different different places i've been attacked for not being a quote unquote registered green, but it's impossible in my state. There is no partisan registration. Mm. Um, but when it comes down to it, when we, you know, when we're talking about these local races, one, a lot of them are nonpartisan races, which means that we are not able to be held to a different standard than the Republicans and the Democrats. They also often have much more achievable, um, you know, signature requirements to get on the ballot, much more achievable, um, you know, constituencies when it comes to knocking doors, uh, things like that. Um, so, you know, these local races are, are really a are real opening for us, um, right? For If I wanted to run for Congress in my district, in a normal year, the Republicans have to collect about 750 signatures, the, the Democrats have to collect 750 signatures, and as a Green or a Libertarian or an Independent in Illinois, in my district, I'd have to collect over 15,000 signatures in 90 days. And I have to double them because they're going to challenge signatures and try to get me kicked off the ballot. So in reality, I have to collect over 30,000 signatures in 90 days from a largely rural district. I can't do it, right? I literally can't run for Congress. Um, I've, been, I've been priced out when it comes to, uh, you know, actually collecting the signatures. On the other hand, when I if I were to run for city council in my town, I have to collect the same number of signatures as anyone else, right? Because it's a nonpartisan race, and they can't repress me. That, uh, they can't they they can't have that targeted repression that we face so many places. Um, so I, I I think you know, greens are too often getting sucked into these larger races, and in some ways I get it, right? Um, I will personally say I'm. In terms of my policy acumen, I'm much more, you know, comfortable talking on the federal level than I am on local, right? It's just where I've where I've spent a lot of my time. But um, the the lowest local, but at the same time, I just talked about the signature barrier, and then trying to run in a, you know, a, I, I my district will literally be in textbooks 
how badly the, the Democratic <laughs> did it in 2022. It runs hundreds of miles. It's probably only 100 miles long, and it runs from St. Louis in southwestern Illinois, by southwestern Illinois, at a 45-degree angle up through the state, just catching the, the cities that they wanted to catch, right? But as a green who doesn't take corporate money, right, I'm going to have to cover hundreds and hundreds of miles to campaign in my district, right? Whereas it's much more accessible at the lower level. Um, Brewers Pilots asks, what are the benefits of registering green compared to you being a registered independent? Mm -hmm. um, it depends, <laughs> right? Uh, in Illinois, it means nothing because you can't register as anything. Um, we have semi-closed primaries where you walk up and you say, I want a Republican ballot or I want a Democratic ballot. You can just pick one, uh, but we don't register. In a state like Colorado or California, it can mean the world. Right, because they're whether or not they are recognized as a political party by the state um, is determined by their uh, by their registration numbers. Right, so in a state like Colorado, if you get a thousand registered Greens, you're now an official party, and all that ballot access repression that I was talking about is gone. Um, mm -hmm. Right, so if you're in Colorado, it's really important in Delaware. Right, um, I, I mentioned them because they're a state that also has that threshold where the Green Party kind of seems to just constantly be like right around the line. Are we there? Are we not there? Um, and so if you're in Delaware, it, your one registration could be the difference between a recognized political party and not. Um, but then, as I said, there's 20 other states where you can't even register. Um, so there is that. You know, the other side is um, when you register Green, you let them know that there's support. Right, you, 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 it's a, a clear statement of where you stand um, as opposed to being a registered independent. I, in some yeah. states where, you know, depending on how their electoral system works, it, it may make sense to run, you know, to register independent. But, um, and you'll of, also often see Greens sometimes running as independents. Um, a big one, a big name that I can think of was Lisa Savage in 2022 or in 2020. Uh, ran for U.S. Senate out of Maine, and she actually ran as an independent, not because she wasn't a Green, but because it was half the amount of signatures to run as an independent. Um, so that 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 guided that decision, um, which one was easier to get on the ballot. Do you have anything to add to that one? Yeah, I think uh, the registrations, um, like like Chris said, uh, registrations matter in some states and make a difference whether or not you're recognized as a political party or uh, like in Pennsylvania, that actually makes a difference between whether recognized as a minor political party or a major political party, uh, which is again, a, another legal status thing. Um, we're not allowed to participate in the government run primaries as a minor party, but as a major party, we would, for example. Um, so it, it depends a lot on your state, exactly how much that matters. I think what's more important than uh, the registration is to become a member of your Green Party, whatever that means, whether it's registering or just being a dues-paying member or whatever it is, like Chris's case in Illinois, uh, because the the important thing about joining the Green Party, as opposed to being an independent that just you know supports the Green Party from afar, is that uh, whenever there's an independent campaign, uh, all of that infrastructure work will just evaporate after the campaign. Part of the point of the Green Party is that when we're running campaigns, we're doing this activism and all, it should all feed into a common infrastructure that we hold in the Green Party so that the Green Party gets stronger, it grows with every campaign instead of having to build a campaign for independent campaign from scratch uh, for one year and then it disappears and then you have to start over again the next year, right? If all of this is happening within the Green Party, um, then all of that building work can stay in the Green Party um, as preparation for the next election or whatever comes up. So I think um, uh, I think your question kind of uh, kind of highlights that that point that uh, to build a movement you have to actually be part of the movement <laughs> you have to actually be a member and join and build that infrastructure together with other people in your group um, and you don't really get that as an independent. Yeah, and I th I want to double down on one of the things that Garrett said, which was you know registering is one thing, but we live in a, a political culture that membership in a party doesn't matter. Right, it doesn't convey. It doesn't convey with it any power or any voice. 
Um, it, it's just a, a legal designation. What's really important is getting involved, right? Is joining the actual party itself, uh, which can mean different things, different places, right? The, the state of California has over 100,000 registered Greens. But that doesn't mean that the state of California, that the California Green Party can turn out 100,000 people, right? There's a, a, a discrepancy between those that are on paper members and those that are actual active members, um, you know, so that, that's a big thing that, that that's really what we should prioritize. And if we were a membership based party like we are in Illinois is what we part what we prioritize, right? Who is actually a, a active member who pays dues in our case? Um, so that I think that's kind of the more important side of, of you know, the idea of registration is what, it, you know, not just registering, but actually becoming a member and becoming involved and becoming active. Um, another question we had on this thread was, does the Green Party actively, <clears throat> actively recruit people that run for election in local elections? I'm in Georgia and I've never seen a Green Party member run for my state general assembly. Um, so first off, I'll get I'll deal with the elephant in the room, and that is that the Georgia Green Party has been expelled from the Green Party of the United States. Um, this happened following the 2020 election, um, and it was done because the leadership of the Georgia Green Party um, basically adopted transphobic platform points, um, and they were found in violation of the um, the Green Party's, you know, key values and were expelled. The, 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 the member, we didn't really get into this yet, but the membership of the Green Party of the United States isn't me and you, it's state parties and caucuses. So um, they were removed as a member party. Um, and and are, so we don't actually have an active Green Party in Georgia at the moment. We're trying to rebuild it. Um, but we, you know, we had a little fire that had to be thrown out. Yeah. Um, on the other side of that long term, you know, I, when it comes to Georgia, um, one of, a person that meant a lot to me, um, and I'm, I'm really disappointed that I only started getting close to him at the end of his life, um, but the former chair of the Georgia Green Party was an organizer named Bruce Dixon. Um, he, you, know, you may know him as the managing editor for the Black Agenda Report, um, but he put a lot of work into trying to grow the Georgia Green Party. And while I've talked about, you know, the numbers in Illinois being absurd, Georgia might be the worst state in the country when it comes to repressing third parties. Um, we're talking over 100,000 signatures to get your governor or presidential candidate on the ballot. Um, and I should mention why we're talking about governor and presidential so much. One, they're like statewide issues, you know, statewide campaigns, but two, I believe over half the states determine ballot access based on those results, right? In Illinois, the only way that we can get recognized as a political party is by getting over 5% in a gubernatorial or a presidential election. That's the only route we have. So we have to run in those races, right? And we have to deal with, in, in Illinois, it's Republicans and Democrats turn in 3,000 signatures, Greens turn in 25. In Georgia, I, I'm off the top of my head and I may be wrong, but I think it's about 80,000 doubled to 160. And it's just as bad for, you know, state house and for Congress. Um, you know, so why you don't see a Green Party of Georgia right now is because we booted their asses. Um, why you don't haven't seen them historically is because they face a huge amount of repression and it's extraordinarily hard uh, to even get on the ballot. In, the, in that state. So, um, yeah. All right. So, uh, number 10 of our list of 12 items is that um, our decentralized party model is flexible to meet the conditions in your state. So, I think this touches on. We talked uh, about this a lot on the last. Yeah. Time. Yeah. I, we've touched on this in a few other places, but just to kind of recap quick, is that. Um, state parties face different challenges because every state has its own unique election laws. So the rules for how you run for office, the rules for how you get recognized as a political party, all of this stuff varies and sometimes varies a lot depending on what state you live in. So when we talk about elections, there's not actually one nationwide election. There are actually 
50 plus DC, right? 50 states plus DC. So 51 different sets of election laws that are all totally different from each other. So um, in some sense, our decentralized model is out of necessity because every state faces its own set of laws that we have to work with, as well as their own uh, conditions, right? It could be uh, cultural conditions or, or whatever. You know, if it's a if it's a state that uh, leans more, um, you know, blue or red, so to speak, that might affect your organizing strategy. Um, what issues that you might want to focus on might depend on uh, what your local issues are, which might include, um, uh, you know, what sort of ecology you live in. You know, so for example, the western states that are facing droughts right now because they they already were deserty states and now they're becoming more deserty because <laughs> as the as you know, climate change and, and weather and all change the precipitation patterns. Um, Whereas, you know, like locally, for me, <laughs> you know. we don't have drought as a major issue. Environmentalists mm -hmm. are actually opposing new reservoirs that my city proposes because it'll, you know, destroy a huge amount of land for water that, frankly, right, we don't need. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a big part of the reason we don't need it is because the the reason they want it is to continue fueling our coal power plants. Uh, to continue having access to a huge amount of water for the steam created by those coal power plants. And if we get rid of the coal, then the, the reservoir is no longer needed. Um, so, you know, my local conditions are one of where we're, you know, local environmentalists are opposing what on their face seem to be anti-drought proposals that really are about propping up coal. Um, yeah. th those different conditions create different positions. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, you know, we I also we want to use... say too that you know, yeah. these 51 different election laws is on purpose, right? The intent is to make it extraordinarily hard to organize a cohesive national political party that can, you know, operate without the influence of capital, right? We to get on the ballot for president, we have to collect over a million signatures. Right, to do that, and in 2020 with the pandemic, you know, obviously we, we volunteers collect a lot of our signatures, but when you're talking a number like a million, you're going to have to start paying people. With the pandemic in 2020, signature companies wanted $20 to $40 a signature to collect for our presidential campaign. We're talking $20 to $40 million to get on the ballot. That doesn't happen without some big money coming in and when big money comes in it then starts to undermine things especially when we're coming after big money <laughs> right so um it, it very much is an intentional thing right we have a complex you know <laughs> decentralized political system because it makes it hard for anyone to challenge the status quo um, it makes it hard for anyone to you know create real change on the national level, especially in a short term. You really have to build bottom up and build your state parties strong enough that you can actually overcome these things. Um, so I, you know, I don't think we should, it should be thought of as just like, oh, it's this way. It's that way by design, right? Just like our ballot access laws are repressive by design. Um, and another thing that you know, kind of on this issue that I, I never really grasped um, until I met a, an, a Green internationally. Um, in, in 2018, I was in um, Amsterdam and Denmark. And when I was in Amsterdam, I met with a Green city councilor. Um, the Green Party is the, the largest party on the Amsterdam city council. Um, they are a radical eco-socialist party. Um, they are banning cars from the city center. They are building hundreds of thousands of units of social housing, which we call public housing. And that and their public housing is mixed income, right? You've got professionals living right next to the working class. Um, they are, you know, funding massive amounts of solar panels and things like that. And so I was sitting down and talking to Aymane Nadif, one of their city council members back then. And one of the things we realized in our conversation was that she can be anywhere in her country in two hours on public transit. I can't get I can't get to the nearest airport that will take me around the country in less than two hours, right? So there is it, it's hard 
we are organizing on a continental scale. And like mm-hmm. Garrett said, that means different conditions. That means, you know, we have we have a million little, um, not little, but we have a million different things that we have to deal with in different places. And they sometimes they'll be conflicting. Um, and then you add into the fact that we have an intentionally complex uh, electoral system and it becomes even harder. So, mm-hmm. but I had never really thought about, you know, continental organizing and the... Uh, <laughs> the whole new plethora of you know challenges that come along with that until i had that conversation with her and i'm like i can't even leave my state in the amount of time by driving right let alone taking a slow ass <laughs> amtrak that's gonna have to stop every 10 minutes to let a union pacific train by right I, I can't get anywhere on public transit outside my state within a few hours so um you know it's just a. Uh, it was one of the ways we realized that our condition, our material conditions of as greens were just so vastly different. Yeah. Yeah, it's important to keep those in mind. Um, so I, I think there's two aspects to this. That one is that uh, addressing the material conditions we're facing, we have to have some level of decentralization in our model bec- just because of the practical conditions on the ground in different states and even localities yeah. uh, to be able to handle these, these uh differences in election laws, in, uh, you know, priorities, uh, like Chris was saying, uh, water is important in some places and less important in others. Um, There's many issues that are like that. There's also kind of a philosophical drive that decentralization is one of our uh, 10 key values. Um, And at least for us, there's there's ways to implement decentralization badly. So I should first say that. <laughs> and the Green um, Party is guilty of many of those ways. And and we we have uh, the Green Party, especially nationally, has has been guilty of uh, bad organizing. Uh, so that's one thing to keep in mind. But in a more uh, ideal scenario, I'll call it uh, with decentralization, what we're really talking about is organizing a bottom up model and making sure that uh, people from their localities all the way up, right, are making decisions. So, um, you know, a dynamic and adaptable model. Yeah. So it's it's partly our choice and partly out of necessity um, to have this decentralized model. And what that ultimately means is that our state parties have a lot of autonomy from the national party uh, to, to make a lot of decisions. So every state party has its own set of, you know, bylaws and procedures and uh you know rules for endorsing candidates and and all this stuff and autonomy to kind of set their own platform and their own priorities because again uh depending on what state you live in and what region of the u.s you live in that sort of thing uh you know you might have different priorities on what needs to happen um and that's okay as long as uh those priorities and all are fitting within our 10 key values and as as chris had pointed out if if a state party uh does not uh, adhere to our key values um, and the you know general sense of our platform and all, uh, as uh, the leadership of the Georgia Green Party did did not do a few years ago. Um, we can expel state parties. That um, we work as a federation where parties affiliate with us, and we can disaffiliate. We can say we don't want to affiliate with that group anymore because they don't represent our values. Um, so we've had that, instances where, <laughs> for instance, Utah. We had the Utah Green Party and we had the Desert Green Party, where we affiliated two different organizations mm-hmm. um, within the same state. Yeah. So I, I think more about the structure is on the next couple of slides. So <laughs> yeah, we kind of got into those. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's hard to break up all this stuff. So, uh, yeah. So num- point number 11 here, uh, to kind of piggyback on that previous point, is that the party is democratically structured with bylaws that can be changed by you. And I think this is an important point to mention that um, we had said a few slides ago that, you know, the Democratic Party is a memberless party. If you say that I'm a member of the Democratic Party, what does that actually mean? That it doesn't actually mean anything. The Democratic Party doesn't take you seriously. <laughs> it doesn't give you any power. They just want you to turn out and vote for their candidates, you know, and, and uh, solidify the status quo. That's really all they expect from you. They don't really want to empower your community. They don't really want to empower change. They certainly don't want to move to a socialist system. They want to maintain power within the current capitalist uh, paradigm. So um, what, uh, what I think is important here is that the Green Party as a grassroots democratic party, a small D Democrat, right? Like um, 
empowering, uh, again, from the bottom up, um, individuals and communities in our decision-making process. What's important here is that when you become a member of the Green Party, it means that you're actually a member. You actually have influence on all of the party's decision-making processes from your local party to your state party up to the national party. You can talk to your delegates to the national party and you can ask them to vote on certain things. You can run and become a delegate yourself and you can go vote and do these things. I mean, that's, I do it, you can't. <laughs> You can. <laughs> that's that's a whole separate discussion. But to, just saying, you know, I'm a national steering committee member and I got there because I joined my local Green Party however many years ago that was, six, seven, whatever years ago, eight years, something like that. Um, I joined my local party. I got involved in my local party and I got involved in my state party. And then when I learned more about the state party, I learned more about the national party, became a delegate in the national party. And then some people said, hey, you would be really great to be on the steering committee. And I agreed to that. And, and that's that's a whole <laughs> that's a whole separate thing. Chris doesn't totally approve of that. Um, Chris said, don't do it. <laughs> it's an interesting experience. And um, I think Garrett's coming around to my side. <laughs> yeah, it's it's an interesting experience. And I, I, I think the, the one thing I'll, I'll say here about it, because I think it's a little bit off topic, is that um, unfortunately, just by the nature of uh, like Chris was saying, continental scale doing things. Once you start getting involved in national things, uh, you get kind of disconnected from your local struggles and your and your local organizing. And it's it's very important to keep your focus on local organizing when doing all this stuff. So, um, you know, finding the right balance to to do the decentralization all in order to to keep that focus is uh, an important and evolving task for the Green Party that we have not always historically done this very well. And hopefully, we're evolving and, and um, doing it better. Uh, but I think the key point to all this is that the bylaws and all can be changed by you, that when you become a member, you can directly influence all the decisions. That means you get uh, a say. You can talk to your delegates and, and uh, be a delegate yourself and, and all these things to influence what goes into our party platform, to, uh, to influence the rules that our bylaws set up for like how we, for example, nominate presidential candidates or something. If you don't like something about the party, you can change it because that's what democracy means. <laughs> and that's, that's a very uh, cool thing when, you're, when, you, when it really sinks in that you have that ability because through the Democrats or the Republicans for that matter, um, we're so used to not having a say and just kind of accepting whatever they rammed down our throats. And when you join the Green Party, you, you, uh, you, that starts to sink in where you're like, well, if I don't like this thing, I actually can change that. I can, I can suggest the change. I can run for a delegate and say, as a delegate, I'm going to try to make this change happen or whatever, right? Like you can do these things. You actually are a member and treated as a member as opposed to what happens in the Democratic Party. And if you um, get engaged and you say, you know, wow, this party's dead, which it happens, right? We're not <laughs> engaged, right? Um, there are areas, you know, there are, we call them paper parties. Right? <laughs> there, there are definitely, you know, states where they really only exist on paper and there's not much organization. But if, you, if you're from a state that has that, you know, as, as your conditions, you can change that, right? Mm -hmm. If you show up with, a, you know, 20 people, to a to a membership meeting of a of a paper party, you're now in control of the party, right? Because the, the, it's a small number of people that aren't actually organizing, right? Um, similarly, if you know you're involved and you're not happy with you know the direction of your local party or of your state party, you can start doing doing work on the things that you think are important. You can you know gather people behind and you can tell the party get on board or get left behind, right? Um, and so the if you know if, I, if you come in as a democrat and you're in your local community you want to change things they might have some meetings but you know who actually runs <laughs> the party is behind closed doors and mm -hmm. inside baseball um you know i live in the state capital and um i want to say it's been almost a decade since our republican party has had a a public office for the illinois republican party I can take you to the Republican Party, the Illinois Republican Party office. It's probably less than a mile from my house, but it's not open to the public, right? It's a closed door place. Mm -hmm. um, and when, when it does open, it's for fundraisers and one directional things where they tell you, um, you know, the, the, the membership, the voters of the Republican Democratic parties really have no power, um, you know, to direct the actual operations of the party. 
Um, in the Green Party, it's, you know, the opposite. Um, we, we are powered by our members. And if, um, if there are, you know, if we're not doing enough, it's usually because of a lack of, le of resources, right? A lack of people engaging in, and picking up work that needs to be done to grow. Um, so, you know, when you, when you say, oh, what's, you know, oh, there's nothing here, find out the Greens that are, you know, I, I have seen green local Green parties turn around because one energized person kind of lit a spark under everybody who was feeling dejected. Right, you know, that, that little bit of new energy was all they needed to get going. Um, so, and, and I've seen, you know, I, I'd say, I don't know, six years ago, maybe, probably right around when Garrett was getting involved, right, in the Allegheny Green Party. I'd never heard of the Allegheny Green Party. I don't know that, that how active they were. Like, that there was, not, right now, I would say the Allegheny Green Party is the best Green Party local in the country, right? And that happened because people got involved and started building. Um, it, it didn't happen because the Green Party decided that Pittsburgh was where we were really going to make our mark. <laughs> you know, we invested in Pittsburgh. No, it happened bottom up, and it happened because people got involved. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you can, you'll see it in, in December when we do our one, our organizing 101, or if you look at some of our past uh, work organizing workshops, which are all on our, our 101s page, all the past ones, um, you'll see one of the things we say is you can organize in your community, right? And you don't need permission to do it. Um, and, and that's very much kind of a mantra of local green parties is you can organize. So, you know, if you're not happy with your green party, start causing trouble, right? Start organizing <laughs> that. It's not like real trouble, but like good yeah. trouble. Right. Get trouble. Start lighting a fire under people. Start saying, "Well, you're the leader, and we're not doing anything. What's your leadership got in us?" Right. Run for co run for co chair. Change the direction. Yeah. You know? As a as a kind of funny story that uh, part of the reason I got involved in the Allegheny Green parties, which Allegheny County is where Pittsburgh is in Pennsylvania. Um, our Allegheny County Green Party had meetings and was advertising meetings, and um, I decided <laughs> I decided in 2016. <clears throat> Like it, even before Bernie lost the primary, like like when he started to run, I saw the writing on the wall, and I was like, I know that the Democratic Party is going to screw him somehow. <laughs> and I said, I just need to get involved in the Green Party now. I just, you know, I've been putting it off for too long. I'm just going to get involved. So I went to a local meeting, and my first meeting there, uh, it turned out the person who had run the website before um, had moved out of state or something. I forget exactly what happened, but uh, they they didn't have a website anymore, and I said. I'll help with the website, and so I, you know, so they they paired me up with a few other people, and I helped put together a new website for the for the party. I got to know people, and before I knew it, you know, I was um, involved in actions. And, state house and you know, yeah, the, right. The I was involved in actions, and and you know, became an a um, an, uh, a local party executive, and then got involved in the state party and all that stuff. So, um, you know, it all starts with your local party to. Uh, to go there and to find out what they need or to, you know, to go there and talk to them about ideas that you have, see what you can organize together. If there is no local near you, um, you can reach out to your state party or um, the national party to try to get information about other Greens who might be around you and maybe you can form a new local party. Um, so those are all options, which I think I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit because I think that's the next slide. But <laughs> Yeah, in our last yeah. organizing... Uh... 101 that we did last month. Um, I just put a link in the chat, but um, it was specifically about how to organize a local Green Party um, when, where one doesn't exist. And the one we're planning to do in December um, is going to be how to revitalize your Green Party. So if you're one of those people who comes in and you're like, these guys just sit around a room and have a meeting and don't do anything, it's how to, how to get them revitalized, how to, how to get them organizing. So, um, you know, like, like we said, these are a recurring series. And then the, la the last one we did and the next one we do, we we're explicitly looking at how to start or, you know, reboot a, a local chapter because that it really is the core building block of the Green Party. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, we talked about the federation structure of the National Green Party. So um, I, just to kind of give folks a sense of what that means, um, 
we have this diagram that's maybe not actually as clear as I had hoped it would be. But um, on the left side, um, it says there's delegates from state parties. There's like a plus sign in the middle there, and then delegates from identity caucuses. So the way the national party was formed is that we affiliate, we recognize and accredit uh, both state parties as well as caucuses that have to uh, um, apply for accreditation. Um, so right now there's five caucuses. There's a, a black caucus, a, the National Black Caucus, the National Women's Caucus, a Latinx Caucus, the, the Lavender Greens, which is our LGBTQIA caucus, um, and then the Youth, Youth Caucus, which calls itself the Young Eco-Socialist. Um, so these five caucuses together with uh, state parties um, from many states, but not all states, because as we mentioned, Georgia and a few others don't have a state party that's accredited at the moment. But the, um, you know, there are people working on affiliating a new state party. So there's pro in progress work, <laughs> I'll call it. Um, but each of those state parties and caucuses will elect delegates to go to our national committee. And our national committee is kind of like our Green Party Congress. It's where uh, the National Green Party makes decisions. And those can be any kind of decisions, including um, how to update the platform, like what sort of things go into the platform. It could be issuing, uh, you know, statements or you know, policy statements or uh, press releases, that kind of thing. It could be endorsing candidates. It could be endorsing actions, uh, like endorsing, um, you know, a peace march or you know, peace rally or something like that. Um, any sort of decision that has to go through the national party um, typically goes through the national committee where delegates from all the states and caucuses will uh, vote on and discuss those things. Um, that's kind of the high level decision making process. The national committee also uh, has created uh, about 20 um, smaller uh, national level committees that focus on different aspects. So there's, for example, a ballot access committee that uh, reaches out to states to try to help them uh, get on uh, uh, get on the ballot in those states. Um, it, it could be giving advice and training, um, but there's also, uh, you know, they award grants to states to help pay for, uh, like, uh, like Chris was saying, uh, pay for people to go collect signatures uh, on petitions so that those petitions can be filed to put the party on the ballot, put it, put that party's uh, candidates on the ballot. Um, so there's the ballot access committee. There's like a media committee that drafts a lot of our re um, uh, like press releases and stuff. There's an outreach committee, which the outreach committee is the one I think that's been working with uh, people in various states to form new state parties. Um, uh, there's a platform committee that reviews the platform and makes recommendations and kind of oversees the process and stuff like that. There's, there's a bunch of others. So uh, you can look them up on the national party website, but um that's how the work is split up. So uh, ideally, I would recommend people get involved first with your local party to really kind of get a sense for who's in your area and learn about your state party and things like that. But, you know, as you, as you learn and you figure things out, um, you can work up to, uh, you know, working in the national party and working with other states on uh, various things, you know, messaging and supporting candidates and all this stuff. Yeah, I want to second what Garrett said. And, and I can say from experience, it's it's probably the best way to get involved. Um, I first got involved with the Green Party in 2013. Um, at my first state party meeting, I was elected to the National Committee. Um, that was a bad idea, <laughs> right? It, it, it threw me straight into uh, straight into national, you know, sausage making. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, you know, that happened. I actually kind of, I didn't stop being a Green. Um, but I disengaged a little, right? I, I stepped back. It was too much. I, I jumped too high up into the, you know, into the echelons of the party too quickly, um, you know, and then re-engaged in about 2015, um, got, you know, helping with the Jill Stein campaign, was elected as national co-chair. Um, and so I've actually kind of done the opposite of what Garrett said you should do. And what I agree, <laughs> my experience, I started top and started working down. Um, and that was just kind of circumstances with me, right? Um, it was the people that I knew that, uh, you know, pushed me to run for things like uh, National Committee Delegate in 2013 or Steering Committee Co-Chair in 2016, um, you know, that, that led to that. But uh, I, I probably would have been better off starting local and moving my way up as opposed to starting up you know top and moving down and uh, most people who interact with me will tell you i'm 
I'm rather salty <laughs> about the <laughs> National Party in many ways because I had a baptism of fire in the National Party. So, yeah, so the steering committee, just to finish up this slide, the steering committee members are elected by the National Committee um, to basically handle day to day administrative functions. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, so that's what I am. I'm one of the seven co-chairs on the steering committee. Uh, currently, it's a, it's a two-year term, so you know they change out regularly. Um, but yeah, it's it's mostly administrative functions. Like so, for example, when the national committee votes on something, uh, someone has to oversee that voting process. <laughs> so that's, for example, one of my duties. Uh, the national steering co-chairs are also party spokespeople. So you know, I in theory, I do more spokespeople stuff. Probably not as much as I should, but I would like to do more of that in the future. Um, and actually, um, it gets to the very last point, number 12, but if you notice from the National Committee up to the right corner there, it said, send delegates to international things, right? <laughs> and so that's the next slide, number 12. Not um, anymore, though. Eh, sort of not anymore, but, but also I think worth, worth mentioning, at least, yeah. that um, there are over 100 Green Parties around the country, or around the country. <laughs> uh it's it's getting to the end of the night <laughs> there's all over 100 green parties around the world in various countries uh not just in the us but um and not just in europe either uh across south america across asia across africa uh and of course in australia um there's green parties on every continent um i guess the scientists in antarctica probably have a green party we'll just call it that <laughs> every every continent <laughs> but anyway there's a lot of green parties um, and I think that's very important because any sort of eco-socialist movement by its necessity dealing with global capitalism, it means it needs to be an international eco-socialist movement. We have to build this international movement. And there's, there's a basic framework, at least here, right? Because there's green parties around the world. Um, it's a little bit more complex than that because uh, some of these green parties have varying stances on things, uh, even though uh, in theory we're all united by um, a, a few key values, but we interpret them a little bit differently. For example, um, some of the European Green parties, you'll notice, lean a little bit more into liberalism. They sound a little bit more like the Democratic Party, uh, or our Democratic Party in the U.S., uh, whereas uh, the U.S. and some other countries are much more uh, openly eco-socialist. So um, they're not all the same, and we definitely have tensions with each other sometimes. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm not saying it's it's perfect or whatever, but I do think it's it's good, at least, that this is the direction that things are moving in, that there's a growing number of Green Parties around the world, and I think those Green Parties are, uh, many of them are radicalizing more, right? They're shifting more toward an eco-socialist stance than they used to have uh, in the past. So uh, that's very important, I think to grow the international eco-socialist movement necessary to really take on capitalism. Because, you know, just like we have our four pillars because, you know, ecology, social justice, peace, democracy, they're all intertwined. They're all intersectional. You have to deal with them all together. I think it's very similar in terms of the international movement that capitalism is not restricted to the U.S., right? It's all around the world. We have to have an inter international movement, international working class solidarity um, through some kind of... Uh, movement and structure and so um you know whereas some smaller groups in the u.s are restricted to just the u.s they're just a small group here um i think it is cool at least that there are green parties around the world that we can reach out to and that we actually do talk to um and that you know we have representatives that go visit them one of the other uh steering committee co-chairs actually recently went to brazil to cover their elections um where and he went and talked to leftist parties and green parties and all in brazil and other countries and uh, if you follow the the national party's uh, social media, you can find some video clips uh, with him interviewing people. But um, you know, yeah, I, and I, you know, the, the <laughs> like we said, you know, at the beginning when we were talking about you know the Green Party of the United States is a socialist party. Um, that's been something that you know, as we said, there's been socialists from the beginning. Um, you know, our interpretation of that is is that you know fundamentally, it's always been a socialist party. Um, but it's been an evolution as a party, um, and the same kind of evolution, the same kind of political struggles are happening around the world. Um, mm. You know, Garrett mentioned the German Greens, and they kind of are the bellwether, right? They're the well-known <laughs> ones. They had power. Uh, they actually came into power um, in, the, in decades past, um, and they tend to represent that more liberal flank of the International Green Party. Um, in fact, the Green Party of the United States and the German Greens don't tend to get along very well. 
um, in, in when it comes to, you know, our, our, even our existence. <laughs> um, but so you have, you know, kind of the, the German Greens and like the, um, the Green Party of England and Wales um, that kind of make up that more liberal, you know, um, politics in Europe. But also in Europe, you're seeing the rise of an eco-socialist faction, um, which is generally called the Nordic Bloc. Um, it, it includes countries like Amsterdam, or like uh, the Netherlands, like I said, Amsterdam has a green city council. Um, it includes Denmark, where the Green Party are in the farthest left coalition um, in, the, in their parliament, and it's called the Green Red Alliance, and they're in a coalition with other parties, including the Revolutionary Communist Party. Um, and then the, the big one is Iceland, right? Um, I haven't seen it much lately, but a few years ago, you heard a lot about the woman that was the prime minister of Iceland and all the amazing things that she was doing. What they didn't tell you in Western media and U.S. media was that she was a green, mm -hmm. right? The Green Party was running, you know, when they were, um, you know, going at bankers and things, you know, that was the Greens um, that, yep. were, that were in power then. Um, and so we're seeing the rise of this Nordic bloc um, that's really challenging, and, and they're rising, right? They're they're being elect, having prime ministers elected. They're they're having you know they're having having control of major metropolitan city, you know city councils, whereas the more liberal green parties like Germany are seeing their power fall. Um, another good example of you know left socialist greens would be Australia. Um, and New Zealand, and they have much further left parties than, you know, and, and at least Australia, that's kind of a new shift mm -hmm. that they made. And the sh mm -hmm. that shift combined with deep canvassing, which we talk a lot about in our org organizing, saw them increase the number of representatives they had in their parliament by almost, by about three times in the most recent yeah, one, one important lesson that we learned from them, I I forget if it was 2016 or 2018 or something, but the Australian Green Party switched to becoming a uh, dues-paying membership party. And that got them so many more members and so much more funding that they were able to organize over a few years to get the wins that they've had recently. So that's, that's again, you know, one of, one of our uh, Green Party allies showing us kind of the way forward for the U.S. <clears throat> Yeah, and that focus on deep canvassing, which we don't have time to get into, but um, <laughs> you know, it, it it made all the difference, right? Long term conversations in your community um, is it builds those relationships that can bring you to wins, as opposed to um, I'm getting into it, even though I said I wouldn't, but as opposed to you know the traditional door knock canvassing that you see mm. in electoral campaigns in the West in the U.S which research shows don't actually influence voters. Um, those one-off conversations where they tell you why you should vote for their candidate doesn't actually change people's minds. What changes people's minds is long-term conversations, long-term engagement and building those relationships. But and what we're, we're seeing, and it shouldn't be surprising that we're seeing the socialist-oriented um, you know, green parties pick up those organizing tactics. Um, and start to see some real change. So. It's uh, uh, there's growing, uh, especially in Europe, but I think it's even true in South America. It's um, a red green alliance, right? That greens yeah. are partnering with the socialist and labor parties, or um, in those countries, and those coalitions are what's winning. Yeah. The U.S. All, yeah, our first past the post system also creates a dynamic that isn't <laughs> existent in a lot of the rest. It isn't in existence in a lot of the rest of the world. So just emphasizing again that um, the best place to start is a local party if you have one near you. Uh, if not, contact your state party and they can uh, either put you in touch with the local party or, or help you out with uh, creating a new local party. Um, and if you're having trouble reaching your state party, which could happen because there are a few states where there's not really an active state party and that we're trying to reorganize, like Georgia we mentioned. Um, so in those cases, you can even reach out to the national party and we could try to help you out. Um, or um, in addition to uh, reaching out to your local state national party, you can also join the Green Socialist Organizing Project uh, where we're running these educational materials and all can also help you form a local party and do these things. Yeah, and you know, one, one shout out I want to give is if you're under 35, 
um, go to yesgp.org and join the Young Eco Socialists. Um, I know for both myself and Garrett, um, our involvement in the Youth Caucus, our involvement in the Young Eco Socialists um, was pretty important to our work in the Green Party. Um, there's many times when I, you know, I would have said that, you know, yes, the Young Eco Socialists were the reason that kept me in the Green Party. Uh, when I got frustrated, other people, other places, um, I had a you know a, an organization uh, that I could fall back into, where I was surrounded by other young radical leftist socialists, you know, other young interse mm -hmm. intersectional socialists um, that that uh, kind of gave me that that support that I needed at times when uh, other areas were pissing me off. <laughs> yeah, our, our young eco-socialist youth caucus is is great. There's a lot of really great folks there. Um, and e even though I, I'm i uh, elder at this point, we're, 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 we're kind of grandfathered in. And so I, I still look around the forum. So if you join, you know, you know I, I'm always glad to chat with you there um, about any ideas that you might have uh, for your local party or, you know, whatever you're thinking. Um, yeah, I've been having a pretty long form discussion with somebody in there about <laughs> Medicare for all and the National Health Service. So, yeah. you know, that it's it's a place where, you know, you can have those kind of conversations long term and in a more relaxed, you know, environment that uh, where you can yeah. you can actually learn instead of being, you know, just yelled at yeah. or judged or the things that happen in, in yeah, you know, organizing I, spaces. I'm, I'm hoping we could set up more spaces like that for the general green party, but, um, but certainly if you're under 35 and can be in the youth caucus, that's a great place to go to meet other like-minded greens and have really great discussions like that. So um, that brings us to the end of all this, um, uh, this presentation, which is the first part of three, right? So next month is going to be eco-socialism 101. So if you want to- November 22nd. Yep, November 22nd. So deeper dive into what we mean by eco-socialism. We've touched on it, and you probably have a good sense of it from this presentation, but we'll really dive more into that next time. And then in December, uh, we'll uh, redo Organizing 101 with a focus on revitalizing your local party. So um, if you've joined and you're not really sure where to go from now, you know, feel things are maybe kind of stagnant, you're, you know, you're not sure, um, we'll talk more about that, uh, which is a really important topic as we head into 2023. Yeah, and you can always go to greensocialist.net and you can sign up to get involved. We just actually had our monthly meeting yesterday or Sunday, um, but we have monthly me membership meetings. You know, like we said, you can change things, right? You can get directly involved and the Green Socialist Organizing Project is no different. Um, we're a 501c4, um, you know, and so you can get involved and come and have a voice in what we do, have a, and get involved in different working groups we have um, at greensocialist.net. And then you can go to greensocialist.net slash 101s or found, follow one of the many links on the main page or the menus to get to the 101 series. And there you can find, um, you know, the videos from our past workshops like this, um, you know, probably tonight, if not tonight, tomorrow, um, you'll see this one up. You'll see the slideshow that we used put up um on probably monday or tuesday you'll see a link to a podcast version of this put up um so you know you'll at, by the at the end of december you'll see all 12 of these 101s that we've done there um you know it's something that you can watch and and uh, look through and you know while we while the while we're repeating the topics we're often changing um our formatting right so um, one example would be in the eco-socialism ones in eco-socialism section session two, we really focused on talking about what is capitalism and, um, and, and the problems with it, right? So we made the case of, uh, for anti-capitalism. Um, but then in session three, we kind of glossed over the what is capitalism and we really focused in on what is eco-socialism, right? Um, so now that we've, once we've defined capitalism, had a foundational understanding of it, now we can talk about the alternative that we're proposing. So... <laughs> Excuse me. Well, it may seem like we're just, you know, repeating the same thing, and we certainly do have, you know, common ideas and slides and thread and threads throughout the, you know, all of them. Um, most of these workshops are decidedly different from the others, 
and uh, that's intentional. So, um, yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, we've hit just over two hours. Um, like I said, we know these are long. Um, we've made them long intentionally. We've chosen to kind of embrace the, the, the amount <laughs> of material that we talk about in these workshops for this first year, right? In 2023, we'll, we'll probably revisit what we're doing with these and you may see us, you know, coming in and trying to do them in under an hour. Um, you may see us breaking them up into multiple pieces, um, things like that. But for this first year, we, we decided to not fight the length and the amount of <laughs> material because the reality is there's a lot of stuff to talk about and whether we're talking about the green party we're talking about socialism and we're talking about organizing these are very big ideas these are very big topics and um, we really didn't want to shortchange them um you know by trying to squeeze them into really short periods of time so um you know again we apologize for the length we absolutely encourage people watch them in bits, you know, if that works for you. Um, we've got a, an awesome volunteer from the Young Eco Socialists who has been going through and time stamping. Um, so that's kind of creating chapters on our YouTube videos that'll really help you, um, you know, be able to watch it in more digestible pieces. But um, thank you for coming, everybody. And uh, we will. Um, We'll see you next month on uh, November 22nd, 8 p.m. Eastern for our next uh, Eco-Socialism 101. Have a good night.